Good morning, church. Nice to be with you this morning. Today, I hope that you have brought your Bibles because I'm going to be jumping around a fair amount with you. We've got quite a bit to read together. And our story takes place in the last few hours of Christ's earthly life before he is crucified. I've entitled this morning's message, Silencing the Voice of God. And what we're going to be looking at is the response of Jesus to three different people. The first one is actually a group of people, but three different settings, three different people that Jesus addresses. The first is the Jews, the religious leaders of the day. The second is Herod, and there's some interesting things about Herod. And then we're going to jump over to Pilate, and we're going to contrast, see the similarities and the contrasts of how Jesus deals with these different individuals, these different groups, on the same evening when he is uh, put on trial to be found guilty that he may be crucified. So this morning our first text that I'd like us to read together is found in Matthew chapter 26 verse 57 to 68. Matthew 26 verses 57 to 68. And it says the following. Those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest where the scribes and the elders were assembled. So who is this group? Who is this first group? Is it the average ordinary Israelite? No, this is the elite. These are the leaders, right? These are the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders, the, the trustworthy men, the ones who make the decisions for the nation, the ones who make the decisions in religion, the ones who, make, who sit in the seat of judgment. And so Jesus is arraigned at the very first stop, as it were, in front of these powerful men. Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Question, is this a fair trial? Is this a trial to determine whether he is worthy of death or not? No, this is a mock trial. They have already concluded that he is guilty. They have already concluded that he must die. Of course, we know from other scriptures that this was decided a long time in advance of this. And the only thing that has restrained them is that the time hasn't been right for them. But now, finally, it's come to a head. They have already decided ahead of time this man is guilty. The purpose of the trial is merely to give the semblance of justice. It's to give the appearance of justice. But it is is not true justice because there's already a preconceived idea and all they are doing is going out to prove it. And so they even arrange for false witnesses to come in and testify against him. But they found none. Verse 60, even though many false witnesses did come forward, they found none. And at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Now, when you read the parallel gospel account, one of the other gospels, you will find that it says, it says that even these false witnesses, these ones that I mentioned, these ones that speak about Jesus as, as having said, you know, I will destroy this temple and build it up in three days, that even their story did not agree with each other. So as much as they are trying to find witnesses that would be coherent, that would share a testimony, that could justly condemn Jesus, the more they put on trial to testify against Jesus, the better Jesus looks. The better Jesus looks because they can't get their stories to match. And even these two that play a pivotal role, their stories don't match. Verse 62. The high priest arose and said to Jesus, Do you answer nothing? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. How much has Jesus said during this trial? How much? Nothing. nothing. He's been absolutely quiet. He's refused to defend himself. He's refused to answer the questions. He's refused to answer the accusations of those who are testifying against him. He has said nothing. And even when the high priest stands up and said, hey, what's up with the silence? He still says nothing. Until this moment, the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us 
if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you have said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have, have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. Notice this. Jesus is arraigned before all the powerful men. He's arraigned before the people who have opportunity to set him free. He can, he, can, he can defend himself. He can straighten out the testimony. He can point holes in the false accusations. Jesus says nothing. The only time he finally speaks is when he is placed under oath before God to tell the truth. Now, just as an interesting aside, the sermon is not about this, but this statement, this little instance, has to stand in balance with what Jesus said in another place about letting your yes be yes and your no be no. There are people who would say you should never take an oath. You should never be placed under oath. Even when you go to court, you should never stand under oath. That's not the example of Jesus. Jesus was speaking against speaking foolishly to, to emphasize. You're not telling the truth, but you're speaking words of foolishness. But to, as a point of emphasis, you swear by heaven and earth or you swear by God to, to try and emphasize the point. That kind of thing, Jesus says, forget it. It's blasphemous. But when you are called to tell the truth before God as your witness, that is the highest honor that you and I can be placed under as God is our witness to speak before him. Anyway, going on from there. So, Jesus is absolutely silent in front of his accusers. He says nothing until he is placed under oath. Once he's placed under oath, he gives a very brief answer. And the answer is simply, yeah, what you have asked me is true. I am the Messiah, and I'll tell you something else. One day you're going to see me, not standing in front of you, with you in the power seat. You're going to see me coming on the right hand of power. I'm going to be in the judgment seat. And you're going to be standing where I am standing. That's essentially the picture. Jesus swaps around this whole scene that's right here. And he swaps it around for them to see themselves in that position. When you look at the parallel gospel account in Luke 22 verses 67 to 68. It fills in a little bit more of the detail. Jesus says to them. Or oh, sorry, they say to him, if you are the Christ, tell us. And now Jesus reveals why he will not answer them. He says, if I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I, he goes on to say, and if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Jesus says, I'm not going to answer you because this is not a genuine quest for justice. This is not a genuine quest of inquiry. You have an a priori assumption. You have already made up your mind about what you think and believe of me. And you are just looking for a reason to condemn me. And I'm not going to play your game. Now, I want, this is important, again, because sometimes I get this strange idea from Christians. And the strange idea is that if you're ever put on trial one day, if you're ever called to testify in a court of law one day, if you're ever accused of something, just follow the example of Jesus and say nothing, because that's the pious, devoted thing to do. It's following the example of Jesus. No, that's not what's going on here. Jesus isn't just refusing to answer his enemies for the sake of looking pious or leaving himself in the hands of God. He recognizes the intent that they are questioning him over. He knows they've already had this preconceived judgment in their mind and they're looking for an excuse to condemn him. Unless that situation is the same for you and I, you and I should cooperate if we're placed in a situation like that. Now, it goes on in the Gospel of John, paralleling this, to say something more. Jesus answered him and said, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I have said. Again, Jesus emphasizes this point. I'm not going to play this game. I have spoken openly. I've done everything for everybody to see. In fact, what he's implying is, you yourselves have heard. 
You've stood there. You have heard me teach. You have seen me perform the miracles. You know the fruits of my labor, the fruits of my character, the fruits of my ministry. You've seen it with, my, with your own eyes. Why do I need to say anything anymore? It's all been in the open. I've never done anything in secret. I am absolutely transparent. And Jesus refuses to answer any of their accusations or their questions. Why? Because he recognizes the evil intent of their hearts. Now pause that picture for a moment. Let's jump to our next snapshot. Mark chapter 6, verse 14 to 29. Mark chapter 6, verse 14 and onwards. It's the story of John the Baptist. And here is where it gets very interesting to me. It says here from verse 14 in Mark chapter 6, Now King Herod heard of him. This is speaking of Jesus. Herod hears the things, things about Jesus. The rumor mill is going. People have been out. They've seen him. Miracles have happened. The dead have been raised. All sorts of amazing, marvelous things. And you can imagine how the story and the fame of Jesus spread. Well, it spread right into the palace where Herod was. King Herod heard of Jesus, for his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead. And therefore, these powers are at work in him. Others said it's Elijah. Some said it's another prophet, like one of the prophets. Verse 16 says, but when Herod heard, he said no. He said no. This is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. He has been raised from the dead. So, Herod essentially yeah, has an extremely guilty conscience, doesn't he? He's very self-conscious about this murder that he's performed with John. He's had John beheaded. Now the rest of this little chapter here describes the beheading of John and the role that Herod plays. Now I want to run through this with you because there's some amazing little details in here about Herod that most people have probably overlooked. So here's the story, verse 17. Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John, bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Then an opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. So she went out, said to her mother, What shall I ask for? She said, you go back and you ask for the head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Yet, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When John's disciples heard of it, they came and obtained his body and went and buried it. Now let's, let's just understand for a moment what's going on here. What is the political family dimensions going on here in the court of Herod? Herod is Herod the Tetrarch. He is the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the one who had ordered the execution of all the babies when Jesus was born. You remember that story? So this is his son, right? Well, one of his other sons, Herod Philip I, is ruling in another area. Herod Philip I has a wife, Herodias. And uh, one day, Herod goes over there for a political reason to meet with his brother because they're fellow rulers in the Roman Empire. And while he's there, the, uh, this thing happens, and uh, Herod the Tetrarch and Herod Philip's wife, quote, fall in love with each other. They have an affair. And they decide that it will be better for the two of them to be together than for, for her to remain with Philip. And so what happens? She leaves Philip, divorces him, and goes and marries 
Herod, the half-brother or brother 